All right, y'all. Welcome back to another video. It is Black Balloon, and y'all already know what's going on. All right, y'all. So today we are going to be covering the death of Steve McNair and a woman he was having an affair with. A couple of people requested me to do this video after we did the Elisa Lamb video. I thought it was interesting. You know, I, I don't know what, what made people think of Steve McNair when I did that video. But, you know, I was like, wow, really, at the end of the day, I should have done this video a long time ago because it's very deep. The story around it, the mystery around his death, and the fact that it was determined that it was a murder and an unalive. There's still a lot of inconsistencies. And there's a lot of questions surrounding both of their deaths that don't quite add up to the story that we were given on how he died. So in this video, we're going to take a deep dive into what we think really happened. Of course, we're going to discuss the official narrative. We're going to get into all of the facts surrounding Steve McNair's death. Now, if you don't know who Steve McNair was, he was once a very famous, very good quarterback in the NFL, played for the Tennessee Titans. He was drafted in 1995, and he ended his career in the NFL just a year before he was actually slain. Now, I think this will be a really good video. I'm glad y'all requested me to do this one because it was, you know, very, very interesting going back down this lane, looking over articles, getting into what actually really happened did a lot of research on this one um, because in 2009, I was a teenager, so I didn't quite pay attention to everything that happened. So this one has been really interesting to go back down the rabbit hole of Steve McNair's death. So to start this video off, we'll get into some old news footage just to give us a little bit of texture. So with that being said, check this out. Former NFL quarterback Steve McNair was found shot to death in a condominium complex in Nashville Saturday. When police officers arrived in response to that call, they found two individuals who had been shot to death inside the residence. Good morning, everyone. Police in Nashville confirm ex-NFL quarterback Steve McNair was murdered by his girlfriend, who then shot and killed herself. Yesterday, police released video of the girlfriend who was pulled over and arrested for drunk driving. This video shows a police officer giving 20-year-old Sahel Kazemi a sobriety test, while McNair, who was a passenger, remains in the car. Kazemi repeatedly asks the officer to have McNair come to the police cruiser where she's sitting. But McNair then leaves in a cab without ever coming to talk to her. Two days later, on the 4th of July, the former football star's body was discovered inside this Nashville condominium. He'd been shot four times, twice in the head, twice in the chest. There's no doubt, uh, we believe now at this time, that McNair was seated on the sofa and likely was asleep. Next to him, the body of Sahel Kazemi, with one self-inflicted gunshot wound to her temple and a pistol she'd purchased two days earlier. One of McNair's close friends stumbled on the dead pair and called 911. I can't be the one to make this call. It's so, so messed up. Friends of Kazemi told police that the 20-year-old had suspicions that McNair, a married father of four, may have had yet another woman on the side. We do know that she was clearly uh, sending a message to people during the last five to seven days of her life that things were going bad. Now, inside of that clip we just heard, they played a very brief clip of the audio from the 911 call. Now, y'all know, like in a lot of cases we've done on this channel, when we get the chance to check out the 911 call, we're gonna do exactly that. Because sometimes, a lot of the times, I feel it's very important to hear it so we can get a better understanding that this may have not been what we were told. Now, just from the jump, his death is very gruesome. Two shots to the chest, two shots to the head. And I think there was two shots on the same side or it could have been opposite sides, but we can show the autopsy picture here in a second. Now, just off of hearing that alone, it's kind of hard to imagine a 20-year-old girl who's never shot a gun to pull two shots to the chest and two shots to the head. It almost sounds like a professional hit. We're going to get into that and the theories of what we think it could have been outside of what they actually told us. But for now, let's go ahead and check out the 911 call. Hello? Oh, my God. Hello? Hello. Hello. Yeah, what's going on, man? This is 911. 
<laughs> oh my god. Sorry, what's going on? Hello? Hey, what is his address? No. What's his address? What street are you on? Lee? Sir, what street are you on? Alright, what's your name? My name is Rob. Rob, what's going on? Uh, okay, Rob. This one? Second and Lee don't cross. Where where are you at? At this um at a condo. Okay. Do you know what oh. the address is? What hey man, I'm trying to answer this guy right here. Okay. Excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Rob, tell me what's going on. I've got it. Where are you at? <laughs> Rob. Yeah. Tell me what's going on. Somebody's been shot. I'm not, not, I, had, I haven't checked the vitals, but he's, uh, but. Okay, all right, bear with me. I'm going to help you out here. Where exactly are you at 2nd and Lee? Rob. Yeah. Okay, boss, talk to me so I can try to help you here, okay? Give me some info. Where are you? I'm trying to find exactly where I'm at, sir. I'm walking out into the curb. Okay. Is the is the person breathing? I don't, I don't, don't look like it. Okay. Between, between Redditch, the the, uh, the, the, the little condos are between the Redditch and 2nd Avenue. Okay. There's a sign right here that says Car Car Cardwell Place, 105 Lee Avenue. Okay. All right, I got help on the way. Now tell me what's going on. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm about to do, do I need to walk back inside? That's up to you. I'll leave it up there. There's two, there's two bullet wounds, two gunshots, side the wall. Okay. All right. Now, do you, do you know who this is? I mean, or t tell me, tell me how yeah. you found this. Okay. What apartment is it? This apartment. Go up. You don't have to go back in there if you don't want to, but I mean, you know. Apartment four, sir. Okay. All right. Is, there, okay. is there a name to those apartments? Is there, a, is there a what? Is there a name to the apartment? No, not that I know of. Okay. And you're not sure what the address is? No, sir. Okay. I mean, I hate that. I, I, I can't be the one to make this call. It's so so messed up. Okay. All right, Rob. I, I, got, I got some help coming to you. Now, tell me what happened. I have no idea, sir. Okay, but I mean, how did you? Yeah, I, 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 re I received a phone call. Uh huh. That uh, that there was an injured party inside this apartment. Okay. And is the male or female? Two. There's two people. Two people. Yeah. And they're both that appear to be deceased? I think so, sir. Okay. Male, female, both? Yes. Yes. Don't know how don't, don't know how long they've been there. Okay. Both part okay, hold on. You say they're male and female or both? What? What are their genders? It's a male and a female. Okay. I mean, oh do you see the officer yet? No, I hear the sirens, though. Okay. It's so messed up. I, and I haven't even been upstairs. Okay. Do you got a call from who? His name is uh, his name is Wayne. Uh, him, and, him and one woman here uh, share this apartment. Uh-huh. And he came by, you know what I'm saying? He walked in and, and got a bill, but he, he, uh, he, he really didn't pay no attention. Uh -huh. Told him he said, but he said, man, I think, 
Thank, thanks, uh, thanks so much. Thank they hurt in there. All right, so he called me because he know I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a man's best man. So I check on him, and he's, it's, it is not looking good in here. Okay, and you said the guy's name is what? Did you get the call from? Wayne. Wayne. You know his last name? Uh uh-uh. Okay, and he's the roommate. <laughs> yeah. How, how, what, whatever situation, whatever, however they had it on, uh, uh, situated. He's the roommate of one of the deceased parties? Thanks so, sir. Okay. I don't know how the whole details. So as everyone is probably thinking by now after hearing that 911 call, you know, you would be very frustrated. Although they were already dead in that apartment, you'd be very frustrated, like, with the lack of urgency and the guy almost seeming as if he's pretending that he doesn't know where he is. Now, Rob, short for Robert, he was called to the scene by Wayne. Wayne is the guy that supposedly shared the condo with Steve McNair. You know, at least that's that's what they said. However, whatever kind of arrangement they had. So, which would mean he had a key to the condo. So somehow, you know, I guess either this was him this was him taking himself away from the case or you know i guess he couldn't stomach what he saw or he wanted to keep it in a private manner he called his friend which is also Steve McNair's friend Robert so he can come to the scene and then Robert called 911 or it's either Wayne called and he gave Robert the phone i don't i don't think it was clarified who actually called first It just started with Robert being on the phone, so I'm going to assume he came to the scene. Like he said, he got a call. He came to the scene, and he's the one that called 911. So that's very questionable just to start everything off. So who knows what happened before they called 911. Supposedly, they say the way the bodies were positioned that no one moved the bodies before, you know, investigators got there. But who knows what happened and why did it take him so long? Why didn't he just call 911? All you got to do is run out the room, get out the condo, go call 911. Why would you call another friend to come to the scene and then he call 911? And then he also didn't know where he was. He had to drive to the condo. So when you go to that condo, you enter in the premises, you're going to see the name of the condo of the place where Steve Magnair had another crib. So he he did it as if he had to go out to the street and ask someone where he was. Now, you can say that you could travel to a place and not know the address, but you know where you're going. You know, like, I, I mean, that's that's true. Plenty of people go to places, you don't know the exact address, but you know how to get there. But still, when you enter in that place, you're going to know where you're at. Like, you know what the name of that plaza is. You may not know the address of the plaza, but you know the name of the plaza. So that didn't make sense. How did you go somewhere and not know what you just, you know, entered in, you know? Or you could claim he was in such shock that he just couldn't remember. But I find that hard to believe. So something about the guy Wayne and the guy Robert just doesn't sit well with me. And on the screen here, we got the photo, you know, the autopsy makeup of the body where I was correct in the first clip we talked about it. He was shot twice in the chest almost very close range as far as the entry points. Then he has a contact wound to the right side of his temple. So that means the gun was on his temple. Then he has a non-contact wound on the left side of his temple, which came out on the right side. So I find it hard to believe she put two right in the middle of his chest, one very close to the heart, And then she also shot him on both sides of his head. One that was a contact injury. She put the gun to his head and they're saying that he was asleep when this happened. So this wasn't like a struggle or anything. He was asleep on the couch. And she proceeded to shoot him on the other side of the head as well. And I don't say which gunshot happened first. But I find that hard to believe as someone that doesn't have any experience with guns was able to put two in the chest and one on each side of Steve McNair's head, and then also turn around and shoot herself in the head. Something here is not adding up to me. That's why I said, which a lot of people think as well, this could have actually been a hit. And who behind this hit? 
Honestly, I'm, I'm not quite sure about it. A lot of people speculate it could have been her father that didn't like her being with someone that isn't Muslim. Um, people speculated it could have been his friend involved and that he was being extorted by police in the area. I'm not even sure, honestly. But we're not done yet. We're not done at all. Now, we're going to move into the next segment of the video where we talk about how she got the gun in the first place. There's another person who's involved in this case. And we'll also look at a couple of text messages that led up to the final moments of Steve McNair's life. So check this out. Yes, sir. CBS News yes, sir. in New York. Um, was Adrian Gilliam a suspect in this case? And if so, why was he eliminated? I, I think early on, when you, anytime you have an investigation like this, you look at many potential suspects, uh, he being one of them. I think it'd be uh, ridiculous not to look at him initially on, uh, as well as many other people connected to... Uh, to the people involved, and, and he was one of the persons we looked at, yes. And why was he eliminated as a suspect? What was it that... Well, he was eliminated based on our investigation. Our investigation determined clearly that we were looking at a murder-suicide, not a double homicide made to look like a murder-suicide. It'd be very difficult to uh, emulate something like that if you didn't know what you were doing. Um, once we got to the crime scene, once we were able to establish that uh, we were looking at a potential murder-suicide, we were able to reconstruct the scene basically through ballistic science and trajectory of the, uh, of the rounds and whatnot. It was pretty clear to us that she was seated in a particular location when she fired the shot that killed herself and when she slid down on uh, Steve McNair's lap. All of that was consistent with the evidence. So nothing to suggest there was a third person in there who may have shot the two of them and then staged it to look like a, a double homicide. Did we think initially that it could be a double homicide? Certainly we did. But once we got into it, we were able to determine that's not what it was. It was actually a murder-suicide. Are uh, there other persons who had an interest in Miss Kasimi? Absolutely there was. Uh, persons that were maybe jealous? I mean, some of that is possible, of course. But nothing along the lines of going to go in there, kill the two people, and oh, by the way, let's make it look like a murder-suicide. Very difficult to do, and we don't believe that happened. As far as the science is concerned, you had no fingerprints on the gun, there's no gunshot residue on her hands, there is nothing literally that ties her to the murder weapon other than what you found at the crime scene. What was it at the crime scene that tipped it? Right, I would say uh, that's incorrect about no gunshot residue. Her left hand did reflect some uh, gunshot residue, uh, although there was not enough for con to conclusively say that. The TBI did uh, place an addendum in their report that specifically said there was gunshot residue on her left hand, which but, would... which me, would just for one second. The, originally, it was a verbal estimate by the TBI that there was right. gunshot residue on her left hand, but in the police summary, finally, that right. it was inconclusive that there was gunshot and, residue. And that's the language that they use, inconclusive. But if you speak with the forensic scientists who did the examination, they'll tell you that there was evidence of gunshot residue on Ms. Cassini's left hand. How do you explain the relationship between Adrian Gillian Jr. and Ms. Uh, Cassini? I've changed very differently from <coughs> this happenstance casual relationship to 200 plus cell phone text right. messages. Right. 49 texts. Oh, I, 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 I get all that. Yeah, uh, nothing you're saying uh, escapes me. I understand, I understand everything you're saying. But none of it has anything to do with the actual event that occurred. Was um, Mr. Gilliam trying to have a relationship with Mr. Kasimi? Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about that. But was he the one that went in there and killed the two and then made it look like a murder-suicide? No. You have to look at Ms. Kasimi's history. Her history clearly showed that she was a woman in distress. And when this occurred, she made a comment to Mr. McNair just two days prior that pretty soon I'll have all of you. And he didn't understand the significance of that statement. But we think it's pretty significant when you add that with everything else that she did, her emotional uh, state during the time uh, shortly before her death. She was, in our opinion, clearly uh, spiraling out of control. But I had talked to at least a dozen people that put her emotional state right. exactly the opposite of that. <clears throat> I probably talked to a thousand people that have told me over the years that their loved one did not commit suicide. She was, she or he was very happy. We spend more time arguing with family members who, who refuse to admit that their family member or loved one committed a suicide. They would much rather believe that their loved one was, was murdered rather than have to explain a suicide. Well, not just and, 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 and this I, is no different. I spoke to the, to the gentleman, Tony, who right. was her boss, right. who saw her that oh, Friday night at I 10 o'clock, who said that she wasn't <clears throat> upset, she wasn't angry, she wasn't out of control. In fact, she was exactly the opposite. Um, she was sad about the fact that her roommate had left, right. but that was it. It wasn't right. that she was angry or emotionally right. distraught or irrational. Right. And, and, and I get that. We've also spoke to witnesses who have told us the exact opposite. So, so 
as far as his cell phone records are concerned, right. he spoke to her at 12.02 a.m. Correct. For three minutes. Right. Were you able to determine the substance of that call? No, he was probably 18 miles away from the scene when he had that conversation. Uh, probably the same, I think he sent her a text message, 1.25 a.m. or somewhere in that range on July the 4th. In addition to follow-up text messages later in the day on the 4th, um, probably 1.30 or so, and then maybe later that night. And he was always never in the downtown area, absolutely never in the downtown area, which would be typical if you're going to ping off a tower where the scene of the crime occurred. Closest he was, probably 15 miles away. At the time of the suspected murders, Correct. he was, are we still looking at 2 a.m.? Uh, in the morning? Right, approximately, yes. So at about 1.30 on this text message on July right. 4th, right. Um, according to the cell phone towers and right. the pings, he's uh, about 18 miles Right, he's in the Laverne time. Smyrna area. That's, that's where the area he was in, where he was pinging off of. Where he was basically most of that night. Well, I'd be damned if that didn't tell you everything you need to know about this case, then I need you to rewind and listen to those five minutes again. Now, the detective seemed like he just wanted to talk over the reporter and you know he gave off a weird vibe to me as if like no this is what you're gonna take this is what we investigated this is the way it happened there's no other way anything else could have happened now he spoke hella doubts while he was talking the biggest thing is the gunshot residue that was supposedly on her left hand they didn't say he said a significant amount he said there was a little bit of gunshot residue on her left hand. He also did not at all disagree to the fact that there were no fingerprints on the gun. No fingerprints. So somehow, some way, she got gunshot residue on her left hand, but left no fingerprint on the gun. It takes you to ask yourself a question, was she left-handed or was she right-handed? Because if she was right-handed, I have no doubt in my mind she did not pull the trigger. That would mean she used her left hand to shoot him twice in the chest, once on his left side of his head, and then once on the right side of the head. You can only imagine what a person would be doing if they're not left-handed and they go to shoot a person on both sides of the head. Remember, one of them was a contact wound to the head. So you would have had to try to shoot him on the other side of the head. It's not like you're just shooting and you just end up hitting him on both sides. You'd have to legitimately try to do it and then reposition yourself to shoot him on the other side of the head. It makes no sense at all. They said a little bit. Really, really, I don't even know if I could believe the detective. I don't think there was no gunshot residue on her hands at all. I just think that's the story that they went with because this is a lot deeper than just what they are telling you that happened. Now, the Adrian Gilliam guy is who we are about to get into, into his connection into this whole story. And you won't believe it. You won't believe it because some numbers are going to come up that's going to blow this thing open even further than what it is now. But that piece right there alone, y'all, no fingerprints on the gun, no gunshot residue on her hands. And they said just a little bit. They didn't say, you know, they didn't say, oh, she had, you know, a lot of gunshot residue on her hand. Like, if you think about somebody, somebody let off four shots and the residue only gets on her hands. It doesn't spray back to a piece of clothing or anything. They didn't mention any of that in this case. There was supposedly just a little bit on her hands. But the reporter, he believed there was none on her hands at all. Y'all, come on. Come on now. We already know just off that alone, I can't believe she pulled the trigger. I don't know why they, they, they pushed that narrative out, but I can't believe it. So look, now we'll go ahead and get into Adrian Gilliam real quick so you can get a better understanding of his connection to the case and the gun that was supposedly used. All right, now this article is from CBS News and this goes into the details of how she purchased the gun and who she purchased the gun from. This is kind of mind blowing to the case. This is a strange story of the gun that killed professional football great Steve McNair, that the gun found its way into the hands of McNair's 20 year old mistress at the time he was 16 years older than her. Kazemi is a tale of strange twists and turns and no small amount of misfortune. At any one of those turns, 
Had something happened differently, McNair might still be alive. Federal authorities haven't said when the gun was born, but they do know who made it, a now defunct California firm called Brico, and later renamed Jennings after a lawsuit involving an accidentally killed 12-year-old boy bankrupted the original firm. The gun was a 9mm, and by 2002 it had made its way into a Tennessee pawn shop, where it likely sat under locked glass, flickering fluorescent bulbs shining off his metal skin. Back in 1993, the gun's future owner, Adrian J. Gilliam, 33, of Laverne, Tennessee, was also living under flickering fluorescent lights. He was in a Florida jail for three counts of second degree murder and attempted robbery. But what goes off in y'all head already just reading that? Adrian Gilliam was 33 years old, y'all, when this happened. This is him right here. 33 years old. And y'all already know what that 33 means. And when I saw this part of the case, I just couldn't believe it. Because Steve McNair was also 36. The three and the six. Something tells me that this could have been even deeper. And this possibly could have been a sacrifice. Something just does not sit right. Mind you, I think, wasn't Steve McNair like... I think he was the highest drafted black quarterback at that time in 1995. He did things. He was one of the first black quarterbacks to achieve certain things in the NFL before it became kind of like a normal thing. I can't remember exactly what it was. There's power, you know, to that life to sacrifice Steve McNair. And when I saw this number 33 and realized Steve McNair was also 36 years old, Ding, ding, ding. Flags just started going off in my head. There's no way I would believe what they told us happened to him the way it did. The guy, he got out in 2002, serving only nine years of a 17-year sentence. Mind you, he had three counts of second-degree murder. According to the Tennessean, who said his release was due to good behavior and good fortune, he was convicted two years before a 1995 Florida law was enacted, which requires convicts to serve 85% of their sentence sometime in 2008. Their home was broken into and Gilliam grew fearful for his new family. Even though he was a convicted felon, he bought the 9mm that we're just talking about for his wife's protection. In 2008, gotta remember Steve McNair retired and this is when he bought the gun. But his wife was weary of having a loaded weapon around their two-year-old child. She told Gilliam to get rid of it. This is how he met the woman who, two nights later, would murder Steve McNair and take her own life, supposedly. So this was just two nights later after he was told to sell this gun. Kazemi, a slim figure and by most accounts personable waitress at Dave & Buster's, wanted to sell her Kia, her car. She met Gilliam in the parking lot of the Dave & Buster's where she worked, the very same restaurant in which she originally met Steve McNair. So think about it. She met both guys at Dave & Buster's. Supposedly, they met for the first time two nights before it happened. I'm, I'm not sure. I never found how long they actually knew each other because the guy was trying to pursue her because they had over, I think, 200 messages, a bunch of calls to each other. So I don't know if you could do all that within two days. I'm not sure. Maybe you can. Maybe he knew her before this. Maybe this was a little bit more than we actually know between them two. She was trying to sell her Kia. But Gilliam didn't buy her car, but he did sell her the gun fully loaded for one hundred dollars. So I don't know where selling a car and then buying a gun comes in and, you know, make it make sense. I'm not sure. Later that night, Kazemi was pulled over by the police for drunken driving. We saw this clip earlier in the video. She claimed she was not drunk, but high. A police video shows her walking a line in a tight miniskirt, her white platform heels left by the side of the black Escalade she was driving. Now, like I said, we did see this clip because Manera was in a car. And he never came out to the police. He ended up taking a taxi and getting up out of there for obvious reasons. By now, the stage was set. I found it weird that they actually put that in this article. No one knows exactly what happened in the final 48-hour countdown between Gilliam meeting Kazemi to buy a car and instead selling her a murder weapon. I just don't understand that. Police have speculated that Kazemi believed McNair had another young mistress, which he did. And she was also distressed over money problems. According to her, she believed McNair was going to leave his wife and move in with her. You know how it goes. Just like any other affair goes, they think they're going to leave their wife and their family. 
And they're dumb for even believing that kind of stuff. Whatever it was, it's unlikely that on July 4th, McNair understood how distraught Kazemi had become. He was asleep in his Nashville condo when Kazemi pulled out the 9mm and unloaded two bullets into his chest and two into his brain, one from only inches away. Then according to police, she positioned her body so it would fall into McNair's lap when she died. Think about that. How, according to police, she positioned her... Yeah, nobody was there and saw it. But y'all saying she positioned her body so when she shot herself, she'll fall into his lap and be with him forever in the afterlife. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. And then, the, and then remember in the clip when he was talking to the reporter, he was like, we believe that it was... You know, she murdered him and then turned around and pulled the trigger on herself. That's what we believe it was. Not that we know it was. We just believe it. And for it to be a double homicide and stage it that way, that would be very hard to do. But it's not impossible. It's just very hard. So to me, the detective was just lying. He was covering up. Because he had so much doubt in everything that he said. Nothing was definitive. He said, we believe that's what happened. But you don't know anything. How can y'all determine she positioned herself so when she died, she'll just fall into his lap? Come on, y'all. Get out of here. That is the craziest shit I ever heard. And as she was laying there, the gun was under her head in a pool of blood. Now, the guy Gilliam was charged with being a convicted felon in the possession of a firearm. And I think he ended up serving two years. Once again, this is Mr. Adrian Gilliam, which at the end of the day, I'm not sure who pulled the trigger. It could have been him or it could have been one of the guys, Rob or Wayne, that actually found them. But ultimately, I'm not sure because he ended that clip with saying this guy cell phone pinged him about 15 miles away from the murder his cell phone does not mean someone else had a cell phone and he was there and he did it doesn't mean that just mean his cell phone was there he could have been there he could have did it someone else could have had a cell phone maybe he was smart maybe he you know was already watching first 48 and he knew what to do he was 33 years old y'all Steve McNair was 36. <laughs> Man, this one right here, I feel very confident in. And I don't think we got the full truth at all of how Steve McNair was murdered in a very brutal fashion. And she was also murdered. I do not believe that she was capable, and I do not believe she murdered Steve McNair, his 20-year-old mistress. I don't believe she did it at all. So, yeah, man, um, I enjoyed doing that video. I enjoyed doing the research on it. Um, I think we've just about covered, you know, all of the major details that surrounded the case. Um, anything else y'all think I might have missed, you know? Be sure to let me know in the comments. And yeah, man, y'all already know what's going on, man. Y'all let me know what other kind of cases y'all want me to cover like this. So with that being said, it's Black Balloon, and I'm going to see y'all soon. I'm out.